Welcome. Good morning. And, and welcome to Uni Emerson Unitarian Universalist Congregation. We are so glad that you are here. My name is Bernadine Cataletto, and I am a member of this congregation. I offer a special welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time, either in person or online. We are grateful that you are here, and we look forward to getting to know you. As a Unitarian Universalist congregation, we think that women's rights are human rights, that black lives matter, that climate change is real, and that diversity should be celebrated. We believe in the inherent dignity and worthiness of each and every person. We are continuing with our summer series of Voices from Emerson. Today we have the pleasure of welcoming Jeff Jacoby as our speaker this morning. Jeff has been, yay, Jeff. Jeff has been a member of Emerson for seven years now. He is passionate about nature and animals. He loves cooking, storytelling, singing, playing the cello, gardening, and exploring the mysteries of the world within folklore. Jeffrey has spoken to our Emerson congregation several times on a wide variety of topics, including spirit animals, Earth Day, and being a creator. He has been a massage therapy for 22 years. Jeffrey is also a writer, and he hopes to have his first novel published within the next year. It's entitled Glimmer Mountain, A Tale of Hope. Jeffrey has shared his life with his partner, Bruce King, for 38 years, and they live right here in Marietta with their rescue dog, Bailey. Welcome, Jeffrey. <clears throat> Each Sunday, we light our chalice. It's the light, this, its light is the symbol <clears throat> of Unitarian Universalism and a reminder of our commitment to be a beacon of love and hope to all. Blessed is the fire that burns deep in our soul. It is the flame of the human spirit touched into being by the mystery of life. It is the fire of reason, the fire of compassion, the fire of community, it is the fire of love burning deep within the human heart. Now in the spirit of beloved community, let's greet and welcome each other <clears throat> to worship as we share our congregational affirmation, we need not think alike to love alike. Those in the sanctuary feel free to move around and greet each other. For those online, please feel free to chat and introduce yourself and unmute to say hello. A lot of energetic greeting going on today. That's great to see. 
So villains, we love to hate villains, but our fascination with them is undeniable. But before I talk about that, I just uh, would like to talk about Worship Team for just a second. If you've ever wondered what Worship Team does here at Emerson, we have two main functions. One of them is to make sure there is somebody here to support the speaker every week, like Bernadine is doing for me this morning. And then the other thing we do is we schedule speakers every day throughout the year to make sure there's somebody here to deliver a message. Well, recently, we discovered a few weeks ago that our uh, original speak speaker scheduled for 723 would not be able to join us. So we were scrambling to find somebody else, um, and usually we get people about six to eight months ahead of time, so we had no idea what we are going to do. So what happened? A member of the team, despite juggling numerous volunteer jobs here at Emerson, a very tragic death in his family, and also preparing to return to his job as a school bus driver, volunteered to deliver the message. So with only two weeks to prepare, he put together the service last week, and it was a really good one. Wasn't it? Thank you. I feel pretty sure that if I hadn't said any of this, no one would have known and would, might have assumed he'd been putting that talk together for months. But he managed it in about two weeks. So I just want to say a huge thank you to Ed Cosper. So whether in fiction or in real life, the actions of villains, which Ed is not one of, thrill us, terrify us, and manipulate us, and inspire us to do things to stop them like very spicy food, a scary roller coaster, or a walk through the netherworld haunted house, the dangerous allure of the villain is undeniable. They stir the pot, put us in harm's way, test our patience, and give us an opportunity to be brave. But what makes a villain a villain? Whenever I hear of anyone being painted as a villain, I remain cautious. From the Native Americans to falsely accused witches, we know that throughout history, some groups and individuals have attempted to make some into villains for personal power or political gain. How many times in history have we been led to believe that an individual or a group are villains when in truth they are completely innocent and the finger pointer is actually the villain? It can be very complicated at times to see who the real villain is and often the real, there really isn't a clear answer. So allowing anyone or anything to tell you who your villains are gives them a great deal of power. It takes some effort, but deciding for yourself who the real villain is and developing some sympathy for the villain is what I will be talking about today. For our opening hymn, please rise as you are able. Number 86 in the green hymno. Blessed spirit of my life. Yeah. 
Sorry for the delay. The notebook walked a, a little bit. Okay. I'm Susan Allman, a member of our Emerson Pastoral Care Team. At this point in our service, let's pause and reflect on our joys, sorrows, and concerns and light candles to honor them today. The three large white lit candles on the Candles of Care table honor Cherokee and Muscogee nations of indigenous people, and they lived here long before we ever did, ever came here. They honor Africans wrongly enslaved here and in this vicinity, and all those hurting and conflicts across, across the globe, especially the dear people of Ukraine who suffer in that nation under siege. We do indeed have many to hold dear. Each Sunday you are here at Emerson, we invite you to light a candle at the Candles of Care table for who or what you're holding in your heart. If you're online, I invite you to light a candle and put it nearby and keep it nearby during the whole service and for honoring whoever you're holding, whatever you're holding in your heart. Please feel free to write a joy, sorrow, concern statement in this book or email it to pastoralcare at emersonuu.org to be read during the Joy, Sorrows, and Concerns presentation. Thank you, Jeffrey Jacoby, for lighting our candles today. With hearts open, let's hold these joys this morning. From Lindsay Thumock, also known as Mom. Good luck to Annabelle and Ollie for going back to public school for the first time in four years. I wish them well and happiness through this change, and we do too. And a joy from Laura Hansen. For all of us, for a place that is safe to see each other, really see each other. Thank you, Laura. There's a concern from Misty, Misty McClelland. Prayers are requested for best friend's son and daughter-in-law. They found out a few weeks ago they were pregnant. She is a high-risk patient and having medical concerns. We do, we do send our thoughts and prayers for that. Joy, sorrows, and concerns always remain unspoken in many hearts. So please say out loud or type into the chat if you're online there whoever or whatever you're holding in your heart this morning. My friend Jeannie. Now in thankful awareness, let's say the Buddhist prayer of loving kindness. Please repeat the words after me. May we all be filled with loving kindness. May we all be free from harm and from suffering. May we all be well in body, heart, and mind. May we all be at peace. May we all be at peace. Blessed be. Unitarian Universalism is a faith often referred to as one of deeds, not creeds. It is how we show up in the world that we live our faith. One way we seek to do this is by partnering with other organizations who work to bring love, kindness, and justice into the world. Each Sunday, our financial contributions unless otherwise specified, are shared equally with our partner organization. This month, we share our basket with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense. Moms Demand Action is a grassroots movement of Americans. Moms, dads, students, families, concerned student, uh, citizens, and even survivors working together in the gun violence prevention movement to end this uniquely American crisis. 
They work to pass stronger gun laws and work to close the loopholes that jeopardize the safety of our families. They work with business leaders to encourage a culture of responsible gun ownership. This group believes that gun violence is preventable and they are committed to doing what it takes to keep families safe. Please offer a donation as you are able or take one of the cards that describes the ways to give electronically. Ways to give are also posted in the chat. And it is now story time, so I have a story for all ages. So would the young and young at heart like to join me down here in the front for a story? All right, well, today we're talking about villains, so here's my challenge for you. I bet it's not going to be pretty hard. I bet you, you're all going to have a pretty good idea when it happens, but see if you can figure out when in the story the villain shows up. Oh, if there's a villain at all. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't, but see if you can see. All right, this is called The Dog, the Pig, and the Fox. There is a little village where only animals live. In it, there lived a family of dogs who had been there for quite a while. There was a mother and father dog along with their dog son, Andy. Andy loved the village and played outside all the time and loved meeting all the other animals that lived there. The house next door to the pigs, uh, to the door, uh, the house next door to the dogs went up for sale, but the day before, the new neighbors moved in. Fox came to the house. To talk to Andy's father. Andy was outside as usual, but he was near the house, and the window was open, so he heard all the news that the fox shared with his parents. Did you know that your new neighbors are a family of pigs? said the fox. Oh, really? said the dog dad. I've never met any pigs before. I wonder what they'll be like. Oh, dear, said the fox. Then I guess you don't know about pigs, do you? I guess not, said the dog. What can you tell me about pigs? Well, I don't want to worry you, the fox began, but stopped. Well, this sounds very serious. You better tell me so I'll know everything, the dog dad said, now very concerned as he leaned toward Fox. Well, if you insist, I do know a good bit about pigs. First of all, pigs are not the ideal neighbors. To say the least, they are incredibly messy. There'll be mud everywhere. And they live in their own filth, and they sweat all the time. Oh, no, that sounds terrible. They sound very messy. And sweaty, too? Are you sure? Well, haven't you ever heard the expression, sweating like a pig? Said the fox, a little shocked that the dog wasn't aware. Well, now that you mention it, I think I have. Well, that wasn't just made up. They really do sweat a lot. I read it online that it is a fact not to be disputed, Fox said. <laughs> oh, my, said the dog dad. I hate to think about poor Andy going to the park and getting on a swing after one of those pigs leaves sweat all over it. 
Well, I hate to be the one to tell you all this, but I'm afraid it's worth being very concerned about, Fox continued, and they're not very smart either. On and on it went that afternoon. Dog Dad listened to the fox for what seemed like hours to Andy before his mother finally asked the fox if he wouldn't mind ending, ending his visit because dinner was almost ready. She had also seen what a state Dog Dad was getting into, and it wasn't the first time this had happened. Dog Mom noticed that whenever the fox came to the house, Dog Dad would listen and get very upset about all the worrisome things Fox told him. Andy thought, well, some of what that fox said sounded like it may be true, but other parts were a little hard to believe. I look forward to actually meeting a pig so I can decide myself. Dog Dad, on the other hand, always listened to everything the fox said and assumed it was all true. As the fox was leaving, Dog Dad was coming up with a plan to help protect his family from those clearly dangerous pigs that seemed to be quite a threat to his family's way of life. <laughs> dog Mom, yeah, I know, this is silly, it's very silly, silly Dog Dad. Dog Mom shook her head as she watched her husband get wound up about the new batch of rumors and hearsay that the fox had filled his head with. She knew there wasn't much that would change his mind once the fox had told him things. She knew that foxes were meant to be clever, but some of the things he had told them in the past had turned out to be untrue, so she rarely believed anything he had to say. A week after the pigs moved in, Andy was playing outside. He wandered over the fence and looked through. He saw a young pig with a model rocket. She had papers and an iPad and was referencing them as she prepared the rocket for a test flight. Hi, I'm Andy. The pig was a little startled, and she dropped a bunch of her papers and said, Oh, hello, I'm Petunia. We just moved in. Are you going to make that rocket fly? He asked. Well, I hope so, Petunia said as she gathered her papers and glanced at them. I think I did everything right. Wow, do you mind if I watch? I love rockets. No, I don't mind, Petunia said, glad to have someone to share her rocket with. I put it together with my dad. He's a rocket scientist over at Swan University where he teaches, so I think it's going to work. Great, I can watch through the fence, I suppose, Andy said as he kind of angled himself to get a good view, view through the fence. Why don't you just come over to this side so you can see better, she said. And Andy was a little hesitant at first, but he looked at their yard and just saw green grass. It wasn't a bunch of mud. He looked at Petunia's face. There wasn't all the sweat dripping off of her face. She looked fine. So he did. He joined her and she, as she made the final preparations, and the rocket was off. It flew up and just as it was supposed to, way up in the air. Yay, they both cheered as they watched the rocket fly high into the air. Thank you for that. That's very nice. <laughs> I have a drone, too. Maybe you can come back tomorrow and we can see what we can do with that, she suggested. Great. That sounds fun. I am so glad you moved in. See you later. So the next day, Andy and Petunia took turns making the drone fly around their backyards and houses. Wow, Petunia, Andy said, you're a great neighbor, but do you mind if I ask you some questions? Well, not at all. What do you want to know? So she asked, Andy asked about some of the things that the fox had said, and Petunia was kind of surprised to hear that anyone would say such things about pigs. Sweat? Oh, my goodness. Fox, uh, pigs are not able to sweat. If we get hot, we like to drink water or take a cool bath. Well, what about the mud? Do you like to wallow in the mud? Oh, no, well, we never do that. I think the only pigs that do that are pigs that are kept in farms where the only water they can find is in the mud in their dirty pens. We feel very sorry for pigs who have to live like that. Pigs are usually very clean, but if they do, it's just to stay cool. They don't just like being dirty. Andy didn't bother asking about the pigs not being very smart. Petunia's father being a teacher and she knowing all about rockets made it clear to him these pigs are probably the smartest animals in the neighborhood. So by asking a few questions and just spending some time with the pigs, Andy discovered that almost everything the fox had said about the pigs was wrong. So he was glad he decided to find out for himself. The next day, Petunia asked him some questions. The tailor my mom used it to get our clothes fixed, Marjorie Monkey, told her some things about dogs. Can I ask you about them? Well, he was surprised that Petunia heard her anything about dogs, so he was really curious. Well, sure, what did she say? So, are dogs cannibals? She asked, a little nervous. I mean, do you eat each other? No, Andy said, surprised. I've never eaten another dog. What on earth would make you think that? She said, well, Marjorie Monkey said that it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and that meant all dogs eat each other. <laughs> oh, my goodness, he laughed. That's just an old expression, and I think it actually means something else. They laughed together at the very idea. I would never eat another dog. Well, how's your health? She also said that there's a saying, sick as a dog. Does that mean you all carry diseases? Andy assured her that he and his family were quite well, so they laughed about that too. Eventually, the dog family accepted an invitation to dinner from the pig family. The mother dog and father pig arranged it with the father dog and mother pig accepting only after being coaxed. 
but it ended up being a wonderful evening for both families, and they became longtime friends. But the father dog never told the pigs that on that night he'd wanted to bring some kind of protection because Fox had said that the, pug, the pigs could go hog wild at any moment during the evening and his dog family would never survive. The pig mother never admitted that she feared to going to their neighbor's house since Marjorie Monkey told her that to be in the dog house was never a good thing that she shouldn't go there. <laughs> Both of them were glad to know, get, they got to know each other so they could decide for themselves what kind of neighbors they had instead of listening to a fox and a monkey. So, when you have a chance to meet someone new, find out for yourself what about them is true. Some spread ideas that are misleading or wrong. They hope you'll agree and get carried along. Their fear and anger may seem quite strong. They seem afraid to let others belong. Their stories and rumors may all just be lies, but the truth is discovered when you use your own eyes. So did you guys, could you guys, thank you. Could you guys tell where the, who the villain was? Any guesses? <laughs> was it him? Yes. Well, I guess the monkey wasn't all that great either, but yeah, mostly the, mostly the fox. All right, shall we sit, yeah, I'll stand up and sing our song of dedication. Oh, by the way, and the pigs did fire their tailor, and they found a new one. Good morning, everybody. I am Kelly Froberg, and I've been a member of this community for almost a year. Um, I'm a member of the choir, the activities committee, social justice team, and the conflict resolution team. So today's discussion is all about sympathy. Sympathy for the villains in others and in ourselves. I'd like to invite you to enter a meditative moment as we fall slightly down the rabbit hole. Please close your eyes or lower your gaze. Find a comfortable spot in your seat. Place your hands palm up in your lap or whatever position feels natural and receptive. Now we're gonna focus on our breathing. We'll take three deep breaths, I'll walk you through it. You'll breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Now, inhale, in through your nose, and release it through your mouth. Again, in and out. Let's take one more deep breath in and release it. What does the word villain mean to you? When you hear it, what do you picture? Is it the bad guy from a Bond movie, a classic cartoon witch, or a figure from history? What does that word bring up for you? And how does that villain connect to your life? Spend a moment observing your villain, knowing that it can't harm you, may remove some of the judgment you feel toward it. There is something in that archetype that speaks to the core of your morality, your sense of right and wrong. But we all know that in real life, things are never clear cut. There are parts within all of us that are wounded. Inside every anti-hero is someone who's been wounded by life. We call these our shadow parts the ones we'd rather not acknowledge. And just like every Hollywood anti-hero, they're worthy of getting to know. When we validate those shadow selves and acknowledge how they came to be, we can better accept all of our experiences, the good and the bad. I invite you to spend some time with these parts of yourself 
to better understand their motivations. Now we're going to close out this meditation by first wiggling our fingers and toes, feeling our consciousness return to this room, to this group of loving friends. Take a deep breath, and when you're ready, allow your eyelids to drift open. I hope that you connected with this mindful moment. May it be food for thought as we continue to listen to Jeffrey's message today. Thank you, Kelly, for that beautiful meditation. I appreciate it. So, is there time to have sympathy for the villain? Maybe there is, especially if a villain never intended to be a villain. From Stephen Schwartz. Are some people born wicked, or is wickedness thrust upon them? If you think of Satan as the original villain, some actually see him in a sympathetic light. After all, he was God's favorite and most devoted angel until God created us and he told all the angels that they had to serve us and not him. Satan was so devoted to God that he refused and was banished to hell for loving God so much. So it would seem that wickedness was thrust upon him. And then you have in Christianity, he's considered the opposite of God and his actions are meant to pull people away from him while in Judaism, God is, uh, Satan is seen as an agent of God who works to bring temptation and trials to humans as a test of their faith in order to bring them closer to God. Released in 19, 1667, John Milton's epic poem, Paradise Lost, Satan is one of the most important characters, and to this day, people speculate on his role in that book as villain or hero. In 1967, the Rolling Stones released a song called Sympathy for the Devil. Even before that song was written, many had accused the Stones of being Satan worshipers. It was because of these accusations that the band began talking more about the devil, which led to Mary Ann Faithful gifting a copy of Mikhail Bulyakov's book, The Master and Margarita, to Mick Jagger, who penned the lyrics. It's a really funny novel. If you've never read it, it's hilarious. Uh, but it's about the devil coming to walk among us with some companions and the havoc they wreak on common people. With all their, they do all these crazy, these crazy things. They do a bunch of really, really, really weird stuff. And the, uh, the song is, in fact, based on that book and that story. And it's actually more about the human condition and how many things the human race has done that are incredibly evil and also that the only way not to be seduced by evil is to know it better and to become a little sympathetic toward it. The cause of all the trouble and problems in a play, movie, or any given situa situation is commonly referred to as the villain of the peace. The first villain that made a huge impression on me is the Wicked Witch of the West in The Wizard of Oz, the movie. The movie. This movie is endlessly fascinating to me, and I've watched it more times than I can count. The first time I saw it, I was so terrified by the witch villain and her powers that I could barely watch the movie. But the viewer is treated to the karmic comeuppance of the villain at the end. I was so relieved when, spoiler alert, Dorothy melted her at the end. There is something so satisfying about seeing the villain get what's coming to them. Why is this? Is it because that's what happens in everyday life and we enjoy this perfect reflection of reality? Probably not. So when a movie or a play gets it right and the bad guy or the bad girl gets what's coming to them, then we feel like justice was served. So why do villains make such a big impression on us? If they are the bad guy, why do we think about them so much and give them so much of our energy? Many very good stories include a villain, and the meaner the villain, the more we love to hate them. And the more fun it is to see them eventually fail. Perhaps we respond to this scenario because it was, it's what we'd like to have happen in real life. And maybe it reminds us of a time when we were the victim of a villain of some sort. And we just wished someone or something would stop them and put an end to their reign of terror. And we would like to think this, would happen, this is what happens to all villains, even though some didn't seem to go on and on, unchecked and unstopped. They help us to see what we don't like. They make the good guys seem even better. Kind people, compassionate people, generous people seem even more so when compared to a villain. Having a villain, villain also helps unify others. The villain gets, gives everyone something to focus on their negative energies on. So let's give it a try and see if it works. So if you just picture yourself at like an old time puppet show like Punch and Judy or like a Renaissance Festival kind of show where you get to cheer for the characters. And you saw, you, first of all, you see this character. What kind of cheer would you give this character?
yourself, you'll find that other people will have you hating your friends and loving your enemies. This quote reminded me of someone I was talking to one day who was proud to tell me that she made sure she got all of her news from one particular cable news source and nowhere else. I was shocked that anyone ever would do such a thing and then actually be proud to admit it. A long time ago, I worked for a business. I, I did tell this story one other time, but uh, I have to share it here because it really fits. Um, uh, in this, at this business, there was an employee who had, was involved in a high-profile sex tape scandal with a movie actor. And when the movie media came to our business demanding information about her and the owners declined to make any comments, they chose instead to target the business and ran a story on the business itself, painting it as a devil-worshipping sex cult. I don't know why, you know, they always go with the devil thing. That's the first thing they attach it to when they want to try to vilify you. That's... There was this lawsuit that the business fortunately won, but still it was amazing that so many people believed the story. It had a devastating effect on the business, and it was all due to one news source posting a false story. Ever since then, I've always questioned every story I hear. I always check multiple sources if a story is very meaningful to me, and then weigh the information myself and consider whether or not I feel like it's true. If you put all of your trust into one source of information, you're at their mercy. All they have to do is point one finger and show you their heroes or their villains, and you'll just go along with them. Being an anxiety sufferer, I know that if I start my day with one of those cable news networks, I'll mostly start, most likely start worrying about things. They're constantly pointing out things that are wrong with the world and also telling you who to blame. Finding a problem and also someone to blame is a very powerful thing. It can unite people to all feel like they're pointing a finger at the same cause of the problem. So if you've ever seen The Music Man, then you know what I'm talking about. So this is a story that takes place in the year 1912. A man comes to a small town in Iowa and sees a new pool hall. He notices that there's a whole bunch of guys, young men, outside clambering around to see what's going on inside. This man, Harold Hill, knows right away that he can win over the people by pinning any and every problem in that town on that pool hall. He convinces them that the pool hall will twist them all into the wrong kind of people. He appeals to their fears and is able to manipulate them into doing everything he wants them to. In this musical, the story is charming and funny, but it's kind of a close reflection of what goes on every day on cable news. Here's the problem, here's who to blame. It isn't quite like the golden crown versus the black top and the curly mustache, but being told the problem and the troublemaker makes everything easier for people. Just like that Punch and Judy audience, they feel that clarity, like, oh good, I know who I'm supposed to cheer for and who I'm supposed to boo. It also creates a loyalty to the source of information. If they typically reflect your values, hopes, and fears, you feel like they must have your best interests at heart, and they are the ones to trust. But can we trust the cable news networks? Many times when a big story is breaking, we'll flip back and forth between a couple of the biggies like CNN and Fox, and both of them are telling the same basic story, but each doing its best to kind of spin the facts to make one side seem more to blame than the other. They tell the same story, but often the roles of hero and villain are swapped. They both can't be right. So where does that leave us? Well, for myself, I know that it is incumbent upon me to discover the truth and not be spoon-fed a sort of truth that only fertilizes my existing ideas and beliefs by talking heads and a new news work that has typically supported my personal values in the past. They're doing whatever they can to win viewers, sell advertising space, and have enough content to fill up a 24-hour news network and keep you watching. So what am I saying here? Are they both right? Can that be possible? Well, logic says no. So where does that leave us? Well, that is, I think, the million-dollar question. We all want to know what's going on, and we all want to know the truth. But beyond that, in the context of this message, I'm saying that the role of the villain is not always easy to see, and that it is best if you decide yourself, based on the real story, who the villain, villain really is. Recently, I was shocked to hear the story about Disney being punished by the governor of Florida. The reason was not that they had broken a law or not paid their taxes. The only reason was because they had an opinion about a very unfair law that it was passed in Florida, and many of that governor's supporters are cheering the decision. And I got these quotes. I, I, I found several of these quotes of, that uh, I think they're, they're real that said uh, the reason they were happy was because Disney is a woke business and promotes a worldview that is diverse and inclusive. I thought, well, so that's a bad thing? How is, how is that a bad thing? And how, how have, has anybody convinced that those are bad things? A family-oriented business like Disney being painted as a villain just because they said a law was unfair? And now there are some attempting to make drag queens out to be villains. And in Tennessee, there's a controversial law banning drag performers. Florida now has an anti-drag bill as well that caused part of the Tampa Pride celebration to be canceled. This is a clear attempt to vilify a group of individuals that are incredibly popular in pop culture. 
but some claim that children need to be protected from these individuals. They've even gone so far as to say they will ban drag queens from reading to children, giving the same reason. Children need to be protected from these people. In a scathing interview, Jon Stewart asked a politician making these claims that, that drag queens are some, for some reason dangerous, uh, if he was aware of the number one cause of harm against kids in this country. And if you heard Bernadine Cotillette's sermon a few weeks ago, then you already know the answer. The politician said, you're probably going to say gun violence. To which Stewart said, I'm not saying that's the reason. It is the reason. It's not cancer, it's not disease of any kind, and it certainly isn't drag performers. And these same politicians claiming to be protecting children refuse to make any changes to gun laws because they claim that they are protecting the rights of gun owners. But it's like the pool halls I was talking about, the music man, or anything that some people don't understand or are uncomfortable with. They try to make them into a villain. I wonder if anyone that supports the laws against drag queens have ever met one. If they ever had, then they would find out that guns are way more dangerous than drag. All the drag performers I've ever met just want to make people happy. Well, they, they do seem to be very obs a little obsessed with being famous too, but other than that, there's definitely no nothing dangerous for kids that I, that I could see. It seems uh, that they find people that make some people feel uncomfortable for some reason and use them to show their supporters, look, we are doing our job by punishing these people that represent something that you don't like or don't understand or are just uncomfortable with. They attempt to paint these innocent people as unsympathetic villains. As a writer of fiction, I create villains for my stories. And it's really hard to create a good villain without de developing a little bit of sympathy for them because the very best, best villains usually contain a shred of humanity that keeps you from hitting them completely. Let's go back to the Wicked Witch. She pursues Dorothy, why? Because Dorothy dropped a house on her sister and killed her. Anyone would be angry if you dropped a house on your sister. Every time I've created a villain and began to work on their backstory, I've always become somewhat sympathetic towards them. Creating a reason for someone to be bad makes, you think, makes the reader think, oh, well, if only that horrible thing hadn't happened to them, they might have been much nicer. So it becomes tricky. You want to have someone to give your audience to hate, yet you have to make them believable, and in doing so, you risk making them too sympathetic. So I'll talk about The Simpsons for just a second. I love this show. There are several characters on there that are villains, but from my experience as a younger person who was bullied a great deal, I would have to defer choosing Mr. Burns and settle on Nelson Muntz. Nelson has all the ingredients of being the perfect villain. He's mean, selfish, enjoys seeing bad things happen to others, verbally threatens others, physically abuses others, and most important of all, has a really good backstory that is often presented in a very funny way. But if you break it down, it's not so funny. When we see occasional glimpses of his house, it's a roach-infested hovel. He lives with his mother, who drinks excessively, carouses with men, works at a strip club, and doesn't take care of poor old Nelson at all. The other sort of running joke is that his father went out to buy cigarettes when Nelson was younger and never returned. I think that because Nelson is presented as this formidable bully that his backstory seems about right, but outside of an episode with the rest of the story to make it funny, it seems tragic. There have been a handful of episodes that show Nelson in a sympathetic light, one in which Lisa Simpson develops a crush on Nelson and they date for a short time until Nelson lies to her and she breaks up with him. That episode in particular makes Nelson sympathetic and almost likable. He attempts to become the sort of guy that Lisa would like, but the temptation to return to his villainous ways becomes too great and he fails. But just the idea they would even try makes him, if not lovable, at least a little more likable. I think that's another part of the villain that becomes interesting. You keep hoping that maybe someday something will happen. Some internal change will make them realize some event or person will help them and they will sort of see the light and become a good guy or a good girl. If they are just evil through and through and never make even the slightest attempt to do anything good, they get a little predictable and uninteresting. It seems that humans are born with an innate desire to choose two sides. You may have heard of kids' games where they pretend to be at war with each other. From what I've gathered from my friends who have kids, they will turn almost anything into a gun, a stick or a toy. Is this true? Parents, do they? Do they yeah, okay. And... Uh, they, they you go for the gun and then they want to play a sparring game with two sides. At one point in time, it was called Cowboys and Indians. And here again is a scenario where we want to have this black and white choice of choosing sides. Cowboys are the good guys, Indians are the villains. A long time ago, it was easy to paint Native Americans in this light. 
there was this accepted idea that they were the bad guys. The Jenny Jump story is a good example of how terribly flawed this thinking was. During the days when New Jersey was first being settled, there was a family who lived on a mountain, now called Jenny Jump Mountain. While Jenny, a nine-year-old girl, was picking berries on the side of the mountain, she saw a Native American appear on a rock above her. Her parents had terrified her so much by telling her that these people were villains that she jumped to her death rather than be confronted with one of them. Of course, as time's gone on now, we know more about the relationship between the settlers of the American frontier and the indigenous people who lived here before we came. It seems like we are the villains most of the time, but for a long time we could all agree, cowboys good, Indians bad, and the game would begin. That feeling of comfort of defined black and white roles. Now we know that the roles of each side weren't nearly as clear as we used to think. So many gray areas come into play, and the Indians are now much more sympathetic when you think of how we came here and how we treated them, reducing their living space over and over. From Joel Kinnaman, I don't believe in good and evil, I believe in grays. Looking at some stories from literature and thinking in terms of grays instead of black and white, it becomes harder to see the villain. I like to explore famous stories sometimes and see if I can see this and, and it happening. Uh, because a lot of them have this hero villain scenario, and I've kind of surprised myself when I pulled it apart. So I'm going to, since I've already started there, I'm going to go back to the Wizard of Oz again. Uh, the Wicked Witch of the West. She seems like an obvious villain choice. I, I love going, she's my go to villain. Uh, she just seems like the perfect villain. But if you dig a little deeper into the story, you may find the witch to be a little sympathetic, and someone else could be the ultimate villain in the piece. Does anybody know who I'm talking about? Okay, the wizard, yeah, he was a little sketchy, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about Glinda, Glinda, the good witch of the north, for just a minute. When Glinda appears in the story, she gives Dorothy the shoes that ultimately get her home. Does she tell Dorothy the shoes will take her home? No. She says, you have to go ask the wizard. She's clearly pretty smart and probably knows what kind of man the wizard is. She will likely know that he will ask her to do something to prove she's worthy of his help, which he does. Bring me the room of the wicked witch of the west. But to do that, we'll have to kill her, won't we? Bring me the broom or no help. So off she goes and kills the witch and brings the broom. At which point, the wizard leaves accidentally without Dorothy, but Glinda shows up to save the day and point out that all she had to do is click her heels together and wish for it. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me sooner, Dorothy says. Because you wouldn't have believed me, is her response. The truth seems to be, well, I had to wait until I manipulated you into killing my political enemy, so now that I have no more use for you, I'll tell you how to get home so everyone will continue to see me as good. She basically blackmails Dorothy to get her to rub the witch out. So come on, you wouldn't have believed me? That's a little thin. Besides not telling her about the shoes when they first met in Munchkinland, she sent her on a perilous quest to meet this sketchy wizard who insists she kill the witch. Since the Witch of the East is dead, Glinda need only rid herself of the Witch of the West, and she will clearly take more power. It's pretty rotten what they do to this little girl. They're probably unsure as to whether or not she'll succeed, but they send her regardless of the danger. So, let's go back to the witch, the surviving witch. She's all alone in her realm, the West, and grieving the loss of her sister. Glinda doesn't even allow her to collect her sister's most valuable possession, her shoes. She gives them to Dorothy before the witch arrives. How villainous is that? I mean, if they were in the witch's family, how is it fair that Glinda gives them away? So, when you add all this up, it makes the witch a little sympathetic. All right, she does set the scarecrow on fire and tries to drown Toto in a basket, so she is definitely the villain, but Glinda the Good seems, well, maybe not so good. So I've talked about several uh, fic fictitious villains, but I'm going to close with this uh, story I'm going to share with you. I did share this in Sermon Reflections one day, so, and somebody said, you should include this in a sermon, Jeffrey. So whoever you were, I can't remember who it was. Here it is. When I started my career as a massage therapist, I had my office space in a historic house in Smyrna. We did our best to keep it clean and do as many as we, repairs as we could since our landlord usually refused. So all this to say, it had its charm, but it was not a modern facility at all. It was an old house, but I loved it there. It was really nice. One night, I was done for the day and was about to leave when I got a call from a woman asking if I could see her right at that moment, if possible. I was hungry and tired, but there was something in her voice that made me say yes. I saw this beautiful black BMW pulling into my parking lot, and she came in. Everything about her suggested that she was pretty wealthy. 
she was wearing expensive looking dressy clothes and she was all dressed up like looking like she may have just come from a really nice restaurant. Her hair looked all perfect like she just left Van Michael's salon. And she walks in and she says, so this is your office? It does one of these kind of things. And I said, uh, yeah, I share this space with three chiropractors, but yeah, this is my office. Please come in and have a seat. She kind of shook her head and rolled her eyes a bit as if to say she couldn't believe she was about to get a massage in a dump like this, but she was clearly desperate for some reason. Was I offended by her comments and attitude? I will have to absolutely say yes. She was rude and seemed clueless to the fact, but at that moment, I made a decision. I was going to be with this client for over an hour and would be performing massage on her. And if I gave in to my dislike, it would make doing my job very difficult. So I, choose, so I chose to be sympathetic. She gave me very little to go on during the consultation. I just need to calm down and de-stress, she said, as she handed me back my clipboard looking impatient. Of course, I said. I meditated while washing my hands on being there for her regardless of how she was treating me. It took some work to really feel it, but I got myself ready for her, and as the hour progressed, I felt more and more confident that what I was doing was making a difference. That thought bolstered me even more to give her a really great session, even though I was pretty sure she would never be back, and if her regular spa had been open that evening, she would have been there. About five minutes after I finished, she opened the door for me to come back in the room. The person I looked at now was not the same. Her hair was a little mussed from the work I had done on her neck and scalp, and her makeup, which had been perfect when she arrived, was now running because of all the tears spilling out down her eyes. Is everything okay? I said, genuinely concerned. No, she said really loudly. But then she got calm and she said, but it will be, thank you. I sat near hoping she would say more and she did. About 15 minutes before I called you, my husband were out at dinner, my favorite restaurant, and he told me he has been sleeping with my best friend and that they will be getting married as soon as he can divorce me. I had no idea what I was going to do, and I still don't. But about halfway through my massage, I felt something happen. I knew, somehow I knew, I will survive this. Life will go on, and I'm going to be okay. I'm not right now. Right now, I'm mad as hell, and everything looks hopeless. But having the chance to calm down and think for a few minutes has really helped. Something about the things you did to relax me, I don't know how you did it, but now I know I will survive this. I am truly not sure what I would have done if you hadn't seen me. I was actually considering, well, you will never know what a difference you made for me tonight. She gave me an intense hug and paid for the session along with the largest gratuity I had ever received. I was right, I never saw her again, but I could tell she was gonna be okay. I'd been so tempted to see her as a villain at first, but I refused, and I was so glad I didn't. Even the kindest people in the world may not appear kind when they're in the throes of having their life upended. So if you ever feel tempted to paint someone as the villain, remember, it may just be someone having the worst day of their life. So, back to my opening question. Are some people born wicked, or is wickedness thrust upon them? Let it be up to you to decide, and no one else but be sure they really are wicked because once a majority of people can be convinced that anyone is a villain, it dehumanizes them. And any treatment they receive, imprisonment, theft of property, deportation, or even death will not be questioned or halted because no one mourns the wicked. Thank you for listening.
Thank you so much, Christy. That was amazing. So this quote is from Clive Barker. I firmly believe that a story is only as good as its villain. It seems to be true. And when the villain gets stopped or vanquished or melted, it's so satisfying. Although I think I'm even more of a fan of the villains that change sides, who become, who, who kind of flip over, who see a different way and either help the hero or even become the hero, a reformed villain, if you will. And with that in mind, I hope that if you encounter any villains in your life, that they are that sort, the reformed villain. Oh, and if they aren't, just look for a bucket of water. It worked for Dorothy. For <clears throat> For our closing hymn today, number 168, One More Step in the Gray Hymnal. Please rise as you are able, One More Step. We hope you have been nourished in heart and mind by our worship today. <clears throat> Jeffrey, your message 
was, has sparked some great ideas that really make us think. Whoever thought of thinking gray with villains, there's something more to villainhood. Thank you so much. Our chalice, as our chalice is extinguished this morning, please join us in our final words that are posted in the chat and in the order of service. We extinguish this chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts and out into the world until we are together again. Please uh, plan to join us next week when Reverend Jeff Jones will preside over blessing of the animals. At 11.20, Jeffrey will conduct sermon reflections right here in the sanctuary. If you are interested in finding out more about Unitarian Universalism, join me at the, uh, at the welcome table at the church entrance right after the service. You're invited to join us for refreshments and fellowship in our fellowship room uh, right through these doors. Uh, those of you online, please stay tuned for fellowship time. Our service is now concluded, but our connection has only begun. Go now in peace and take peace wherever you go. Thank you so much, Bernie. I appreciate it very much. Oh, thank you.